Hello everyone and welcome to The Shelf. And today we'll be taking a look at a company that's helped a lot of collectors put anime on their shelves, Right Stuff. The story starts in the early 1980s in Des Moines, Iowa. A businessman by the name of Todd Burson wanted to feed his interest in space by buying a telescope, but he didn't want to pay full price. He decided to set up a shell company, a business that's not actively operating and owns few if any assets, in order to purchase telescopes at the wholesale price. He named his company The Right Stuff, which was inspired by the 1983 film of the same name. Over time, he decided to use the company to make some extra cash by actually selling some telescopes. As telescope sales were starting to increase, Todd, clearly a big fan of space, started thinking about one of his favorite shows as a kid, Astro Boy. He'd been trying to find a copy of it for years, but hadn't had any luck. He decided to add the task of finding Astro Boy to his company's mission, and he enlisted the help of his friend, Sean Kleckner. In 1987, the search began. The first point of contact was the series' producer in the United States, Fred Ladd who put them in touch with the people in Japan who owned the rights to the series, Suzuki Associates. He was able to acquire the licensing rights for North America, but they ran into a big problem. They didn't actually have anything that they could sell. While they had obtained the rights to sell the series, Suzuki Associates didn't have any copies of Astro Boy's English release. The version of the show that Todd and other Western kids in the 60s and 70s grew up with was released by NBC. The series aired on the network from September 7th, 1963 to August 20th, 1965 but reruns were shown until 1976. The Astro Boy that NBC viewers received wasn't exactly identical to the original release. The biggest difference, other than being dubbed into English, was the number of episodes. NBC initially only planned to air 52 episodes, but the series was so successful that they ordered another 52 the next year. And that would be the last batch of episodes that they released, for a total episode count of 104. The problem is that the original series had 124 episodes at the time, and it would continue airing in Japan well after NBC stopped broadcasting new ones bringing the original series' total episode count to 193. As you may have guessed, the NBC broadcast cut several episodes, but they also changed the order in which they were run. Some of the other changes made to the series were rewritten scripts and changing the name of the series and the titular character from Mighty Adam to Astro Boy. If Suzuki Associates not having the English version wasn't bad enough, they were told that all of the film had been destroyed. They discovered that all of NBC's original masters had been destroyed in 1975, but Furson didn't believe that every last copy had been erased. License in hand, they began combing through the phone book, calling hundreds of TV stations that aired the series in the 60s in order to locate anyone who worked there at the time who may have copies of the film prints. To their surprise, there were quite a lot of copies floating around, and during this reclamation effort, they received prints from all over the world. Once they gathered enough material, they had to organize and clean the prints, as well as figure out how they were going to package everything together in the final product. But by 1989, things had finally come together. Before they actually sold anything, they made one small change to the company. They removed one F from its name. They did this in order to make their name stand out, figuring that the misspelling would make the name more memorable. The first anime release was Astro Boy 1 on VHS. It contained two episodes and would be sold for $24.95. The two episodes were episode number one, Birds of Astro Boy, and episode 67, The Monster Machine. In order to get the word out, they advertised the VHS release in fan and trade magazines. Not only did they release more volumes later in the year, but 1989 was also when Right Stuff started its mail order catalog despite only having four things to sell at the time, Astro Boy tapes volumes one through four, and fortunately for the young company, sales were strong. With the success of one 60s title, Bright Stuff leaned into this nostalgic niche for the next couple of years. They released Gigantor in 1990 and Eighth Man in 1991. This strategy worked, and both Astro Boy and Gigantor made Tower Records' best sellers list in 1991. Behind the scenes, Sean Kleckner had assumed the role of executive director and covered most aspects of the company's production process. He also wanted to expand the company's mail order business and reached out to various companies like Streamline Pictures and Central Park Media to see if they would like to add their products to the Right Stuff catalog. And by 1992, the catalog had grown from four items to 40, selling a variety of products from tape cassettes to t-shirts. With this recent expansion, they changed their name once again to the Right Stuff International. The next big milestone for the company came in 1994 when they moved into their first office on University Boulevard in Des Moines, Iowa. They also launched their first website, www.infonet.net slash showcase slash The company also started hiring more people, including Jeff Thompson, a producer, and Alyssa Kohi, the company's general manager, was brought on in 1995. The company continued to grow over the next two years and had to move again in 1996. By this point, Right Stuff had kind of become the default source of information for anime fans. They also fielded questions from customers about the status of their orders. Noticing this, Sean Kleckner reached out to several companies, asking them if they'd like Right Stuff to handle some of these issues for them. Right Stuff would end up taking over several tasks for these companies, including answering mail, handling data entry, creating web stores, and processing fulfillment. Here's an example of the variety of work that was outsourced to them. If you contacted Genion during this period of time, their email address would end with at rightstuff.com. The company's catalog had grown in step with the company. 
and it now sat at 144 pages with over 2,200 items available for sale. The company also decided to give its website a more memorable domain, www.writestuffanime.com. The company would celebrate its 10-year anniversary in 1997 and would release two new shows. The first was Lutta, The Fantastic Adventure of Yoko in spring, but on August 15, 1997, Right Stuff announced the release of the irresponsible Captain Tyler. The release of Tyler also marked the first time the company would create a website for one specific series, www.tyler.com. At around this time, Right Stuff also dipped its toes into the adult video market with the creation of a new label, Critical Mass Video. Here's how Sean Kleckner described his creation to Animation World Magazine. Manga Entertainment released an edited version of Violence Jack, and a lot of fans wanted to see it uncut. So we arranged with Manga Entertainment to release an unedited edition in November 1996. It was too intense for our regular Right Stuff line, so we created the Critical Mass label. Then, in 1997, we had a chance to license a really funny adult comedy, Weather Report Girl, and we didn't want to pass it up. We do not have any specific plans at present for any more Critical Mass releases, but there will doubtlessly be more when the right titles come along. The late 1990s saw another increase in anime's popularity in Western markets. In 1998 alone, several iconic anime were released. Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z debuted on Cartoon Network, and Pokemon aired on Kids WB. The number of anime licenses were increasing, along with the popularity of anime as a whole, which wasn't exactly a bad thing for a company that sells anime and anime-related merchandise. And the company continued to grow throughout this period. Side note, 1998 would also mark the launch year for Right Stuff's Got Anime Club. You could pay $12 a year to receive an additional 10% discount on already discounted VHS purchases. In 2001, Rice Up would try their hand at releasing anime on a new format, DVD. Sean Kleckner didn't want to fully commit to the change because of the cost of production. However, they found an interesting way to mitigate that risk. Their first DVD release would be The Irresponsible Captain Tyler. The first 750 fans to pre-order the set would have their names recorded on the disc as a thank you, and the set was released on March 27, 2001. And after the final volume and series box set, a Boogie Pop Phantom was released on February 12, 2002, Rice Up would cease all production of VHS tapes. Near the end of 2001, Right Stuff partnered with ADB Films to form Anime Tracks. Anime Tracks was a music label with the goal of releasing anime soundtracks to be sold in Suncoast, a music and home video retailer. 2001 also marked major changes to the company's website and catalog. They focused on improving the customer experience on the website, taking over hosting duties, and providing customers with the ability to review the status of their orders online. As for the catalog, they moved all adult content to a special sealed section in order to make it more appealing to general audiences. But more changes were coming over the next few years. They added age ratings in 2002 and switched from an annual black and white catalog to a biannual full colored one. The biggest change though was the increasing presence of manga. In 2005, the company had grown so much that they needed to switch offices again. After settling in, they revamped the Got Anime website and launched the Anime Today podcast, with its first episode premiering on November 11, 2005. Two years later, in 2007, they founded Nozomi Entertainment. But the good times wouldn't last forever, and the late 2000s were a rough time for many people and businesses, including Right Stuff. With the economic downturn came falling DVD sales and a general reduction in consumer spending, and the company had to adapt. I had continually watched the cost of programming skyrocket, and with the majors playing off the popularity of mass market programs like Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, and Pokemon, there was a rush to market of as much content as possible. Release schedules were incredibly full and there was a giant amount of product in the marketplace. We had paused our licensing efforts simply because the cost was just not economical in my estimation, and I just didn't feel that the return on investment was there. I focused more efforts on our e-commerce and consulting business. At that time, home video, in multi-disc releases, and TV was the primary sales mechanisms. Legal streaming really hadn't come into its own. It was sad to see those issues in the field, but we did all we could to help the vendors push the product through with sales and promotions. I didn't have a concern with survival, to be honest, as I knew there was definitely a continuing market for anime. I just didn't feel that there was a market for this much product being put out all at the same time and at the price points that were required to license them, or that the customers could absorb this much material at once, given their own budgets. Business can be cyclical. At present, there's another run-up in licensing costs and a large quantity of product being produced. There's more competition for the viewer's eye, but also more mediums where that content can be consumed. You have to adapt to the marketplace as it changes. Some companies in the bubble era simply didn't have the ability or will to do so. Right Stuff was able to pull through and began expanding again in the early 2010s. On March 14, 2012, Right Stuff launched Five Point Pictures, a new label that would focus on live action shows. On June 29, 2012, at Anime Expo, Right Stuff announced Lucky Penny Entertainment. The focus of this label would be releasing cheaper versions of anime. This would also mark a shift for Nozomi Entertainment, who would now focus on premium, limited edition sets. And that's most of Right Stuff's history, from its origins to the modern era. Obviously, some big things have happened since then, like their partnership with Sunrise in 2014 that brought Gundam to North America, the launch of the Arya Kickstarter in 2017 and all the ones that followed it, as well as having to deal with the pandemic and supply shortages in recent times. But for the last decade, Right Stuff has kind of just been doing its thing 
without making any major changes to the business. That all ended just a short while ago. On August 4, 2022, Crunchyroll announced that they had acquired Right Stuff. This sparked a lot of discussion among anime fans worried about overconsolidation. For those who aren't familiar, here's a not so brief recap. On July 31st, 2017, Sony acquired Funimation for $150 million. In February 2019, Aniplex, which is owned by Sony, acquired the anime division of Madman Entertainment, a distributor that operates in Australia and New Zealand, for $25 million US dollars. In May, Funimation added Manga Entertainment, who distributed anime to the United Kingdom and Ireland, to its list of distributors. And later that year, Sony consolidated three of its companies, Funimation, Wakanim, a streaming service in France, Germany, Russia, and Nordic countries, and Madman Anime Group to form the Funimation Global Group. Two years later, in August of 2021, Funimation Global Group acquired Crunchyroll from AT&T for $1.175 billion, finalizing an agreement from December of 2020. And their subsequent purchase of Right Stuff brings us to where we're at today. Now, how did Right Stuff's acquisition affect its business? If you recall, under Right Stuff, there were four different labels. Five Point Pictures, Critical Mass Video, Lucky Penny Entertainment, and Nozomi Entertainment. The last two, Nozomi and Lucky Penny, are still owned by Right Stuff and Crunchyroll by extension. Lucky Penny hasn't been very active, but their last set haven't been released in 2015. After Nozomi, things are apparently going on as they always have, as Crunchyroll takes time to evaluate all the rights, and their acquisition isn't going to affect the upcoming release of Dirty Pair. Now, Critical Mass Video, Right Stuff's adult label, is interesting. Over the years, Sony's become fairly infamous in the gaming community for its censorship of sexual content, and their stance on explicit sexual content didn't change after the acquisition. Most of Right Stuff's announcement focuses on reassuring customers that nothing was changing unless you bought something erotic. If you did, you were redirected to an entirely different FAQ, where they immediately confirmed that they will no longer be carrying erotic merchandise or content. All existing orders would be filled by BuyAnime.com, an erotic anime store owned by Arrow Anime LLC. Critical Mass Video was sold to Arrow Anime and another adult video company, Adult Source Media. Next is Five Point Pictures. While I haven't seen anything that indicates that the label has been officially closed, they don't appear to have released anything since the initial batch of films that they announced at its founding. I've reached out to Crunchyroll for more information on the status of both Five Point Pictures and Lucky Penny, but I haven't heard back from them at the time of recording. And that's pretty much it. If you were wondering what Right Stuff was and why a bunch of people started talking about it a few months ago, hopefully this answered all of your questions. Thank you all for watching, and if you liked the video, I appreciate it if you liked the video, and feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. Once again, thank you all for watching, and I'll talk to you later.